Now, when we're talking about group analysis, then uh, the problems tend to be outliers, normality, and equality of variance. Uh, and all these three hit in different ways uh, and also interact in different ways, particularly once you get to threshold. In fact, when you're doing a group analysis, the, the, the problem is that there's a, a number of moving parts and they all interact. And, and these are all decision points that you have to make. For example, you know, what group level model should you use? Uh, fixed effects, random effects, mixed effects, they all have different consequences in terms of these, um, uh, of um, violating these assumptions. Uh, similarly, how are you going to uh, manage outliers? What are you going to do about them? Um, and finally, as I sort of said at the outset uh, of this lecture, um, the exact method that you use for thresholding is also very important and for correcting for multiple comparison. And here, of course, your decision points are what p-value to pick. Uh, are you going to do a family-wise error versus an FDR? Cluster level versus voxel level? Parametric versus non-parametric? And every choice that you make sort of makes you fall in a different potential violation of the assumptions. Now, you know, heteroscedasticity being a principal uh, problem, um, you know, where, where does it come from? What is, you know, where does it come from in terms of our group analysis? Well, um, a number of different um, possible areas could lead to heteroscedasticity. For one, there's just a spatial mismatch between subjects and cortical structures. Uh, and this can be fairly sizable. Um, and so this means that it, just by mismatching the registration, either the registration of brains or actual differences in neuroanatomy and functional neuroanatomy across people, you can actually get structured but changing, since it's not always predictable, uh, patterns of noise. Uh, similarly, uh, you can just get systematic differences in, in, mag in uh, activation magnitude, ac um, both across participants and across different sessions of the same participants, if you're doing that kind of uh, repeated design. And this could be due to you know, any of a number of things, physiological fluctuations, motion, baseline. What if your participant mi misunderstands your instructions, right? Or doses off or something of that sort. Um, and uh, finally, uh, you can just get also differences in the elicitation of brain network across subjects, just due to you know, some kind of genetic or epigenetic differences or different cognitive strategies. So these are all differences, unfortunately, that then end up being modeled as the variance term in your group analysis. So in other words, the denominator of your t-test. So that's why it's the, these, uh, these issues become very problematic. Now, the real problem that we have then is really a problem of sensitivity of being able to detect an effect when there is one. Here's a wonderful, um, uh, a wonderful illustration of this by Firion and colleagues. Now, they had a large uh, sample, if I remember, of some 81 uh, participants doing a task. And the group analysis, this is the result from the group analysis. The very, you know, the very conventional uh, smiley, smiley face um, triclops a very conventional result for kind of working memory, that sort of sort of high uh, cognitive, sort of higher cognition type task. Now what they did is they picked smaller, small subgroups. They, they took these participants and they, they segmented them in small subgroups of 13 um, subjects each, and then just repeated the analysis and looked at what results would you get if you randomly picked 13 uh, participants from this, from this sample. Keep in mind that at the time, 2007, 15 was a pretty, pretty decent sample. You know, between 50, uh, 13 and 15, that was considered to be a pretty decent sample. Um, and what is so surprising is that if you look at the activation that you get in each subsample, it varies quite a bit. So sometimes, according to whether you got the, these, this sample or this sample, some parts of the brain might or might not be, uh, appear to be active. You know, the more, the more posterior part of parietal lobe versus its more anterior segment. Um, this sort of lateral, I guess, uh, premotor or, or, or um, um, uh, frontal eye fields activation. You know, it is here, but it is not here. 
So you would, you would infer something different according to which subgroup you picked out of this group. And yet we know that the real group effect is this. So this is clearly saying that we do have a problem with sensitivity. We have a difficulty. Even when we know that in the whole group, this is the effect, we have a hard problem tracking, uh, obtaining that, that effect if we only, if we subsample this group. So in fact, as they say, we observe that the analysis of six different groups of 13 subjects would lead to different reports of the set of activated regions for the same experimental condition and standard threshold. Why is this the case? Well, they dug into the data and it turns out there's a number of reasons and they're all about violation of uh, assumptions. Um, so this is sort of a different contrast in that paper left button press versus right button press, as simple as it gets. Um, this is the group activation across, if I remember correctly, the full sample. And then if you look at the areas that have high variance, they turn out to coincide very well with the areas that are active. So in other words, the greater the group effect, the greater the variance. The, it's the definition of heteroskedasticity. The, the, the effect size and the variance size are correlated. It's the definition of heteroskedasticity. So we've just demonstrated violation of that assumption. Um, on top of it, just the distribution of the estimators is just not normal. If you do a D'Agostino Pearson normality test, one of many ways of testing for normality, um, it turns out that, that uh, the parameter estimate, beta hat, uh, is just not normal. Uh, in this case, just about 30% of the voxels failed at the test, meaning that they, they're, not, um, they're not normally distri distributed. Uh, if you scale it by variance, you still get some non-normality, just about 10% of the brain. Although it doesn't quite appear to co-localize, um, with the regions of activation. So it's unclear if it's playing a role in what we get um, as the result. And, and of course, I've shown you this for, for, one, uh, for one example subtractions. This is just to, to show that it, um, this extends sort of to other subtractions. This is an analysis of audio minus video instructions. And you can see sort of this really large um, temporal lobe activation, pretty standard, and some frontal activation, pretty standard for auditory instructions. And if you look at the variance, you know, you see that the, 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 the parts of the brain with high variance are the parts of the brain that are active. So again, the magnitude of the effect is dependent or is correlated with the magnitude of the variance. Textbook definition of heteroskedasticity. And again, if you did the D'Agostino Pearson test, you will see that there's a lot of non-normality distributed through the brain. And in, in this particular case, some of the non-normality you can see it here, for example, does match even, even so this is the non-normality just for beta. And you can see that it does match in some instances, areas that are active. And this down here on the right is the non-normality for the beta scaled by the variance estimate. And uh, you can see that again, it does match some of the areas of activation, for example, right here, right there. Um, so it's very clear, and, and this is in a very large group, 81, uh, 81 volunteers. It's very clear that there are violations of the assumptions of the parametric approach. Now they dug deeper into the data because they wanted to find in the data set whether they could extract um, whether they could extract uh, recommendations. And so they did a number of things. They, uh, with a similar subgroup analysis, uh, they looked at the Kappa, the co so-called uh, Cohen's Kappa index, which is really, it's a measure of inter-rater agreement, but for, um, for qualitative as opposed to quantitative data. You can think of it as the reliability or a, a reproducibility index. How, how well are we reproducing the result if we have 10 versus 13 versus 16 versus 20 versus 27 versus 40 participants? In terms of, if you just look at the whole map of activations that you get at each of the sa these samples, how well are we getting the, um, the, full, the full sample? Turns out 
um, you know, not until maybe by the time you're at 20, you're kind of getting close to the full, uh, to the full pattern. By the time you're at 27, you're pretty close. You're, you're close to 0.8, which is a desirable, um, a desirable number. Of course, once you have 40, so half the sample, you are, you are really close to getting the full, um, the same map that you would get if you had the full data set. Um, so this is already a recommendation in terms of how many subjects do I need to ensure I'm getting something that would look like what I would get if I got you know, a really large sample, like 81 participants. Then the second thing they looked at is the sensitivity. So, you know, how well could they detect an effect when there was an effect? In other words, the proportion of the full map that are active in each, uh, in each subsample. So, you know, in the subsample of 10, what proportion of voxels were active um, with respect to sort of the full? And as you can see, this obviously uh, is a positive function. Um, sensitivity is a positive function uh, of number of subjects. Uh, and again, by the time you get to 27, you're, you're pretty close. Of course, 40, you're very close. But by the time you're at 27, sort of, you can see there's that sort of inflection there. So 27 might be sort of a, you know, where the elbow is. And so might be the, the convenient trade-off between too many subjects, sort of being able to acquire that many subjects and getting sort of um, at, at the margin of your every new subject, being able to get a good bang for your buck. Right, well, it, it almost looks like there's an elbow here. So the derivative, how much were the, 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 the marginal uh, advantage of adding one more participant from here on might be decreasing. Um, then what they did, exactly the same analysis, but looking at the distance between the centroids of the maps. So if I get look at my map for 10 participants versus 13 versus 16, how distant are the centroids from the centroids that you get in the full sample. And you can see that sort of the distance again decreases with number. If you only take 10, you actually get quite a, quite a, quite a meaningful difference between where the, where the centroids of your activations are located in your subsample of 10 map versus the full sample. And as you can see, sort of it decreases. And again, there's this sort of magic number 27 that seems to be um, that seems to, to function as an elbow. I meaning by the time you get to 27, you're not decreasing much the distance if you then go to 40. And finally, um, um, if, you, if you do the exact same analysis, but consider, but, but, but require sort of larger, uh, larger um, clusters. So if you require clusters of 30 voxels, uh, as opposed to just 10 voxels to do this analysis, you kind of get exactly the same thing. Uh, although perhaps a more, a more pronounced decrease from 27 to 40. Um, but overall, uh, out of all these analysis, they conclude, uh, Thirion and colleagues, um, that our results clearly indicate that, you know, a, a sample size of 20 is a, a minimum, a minimum to have acceptable reliability, preferably 20 samples. And then they did the exact same analysis, but looking at um, the threshold for doing a cluster correction. So they looked at doing, if you remember, we need to set, we need to set, um, I will get back to this a little bit down, but if you remember when we do a cluster correction using uh, Gaussian random field theory, uh, we need to set how high up do we want the threshold uh, to be. And so what they have here, what they do here, is they vary how high up that threshold is and then look at exactly the same metrics. So the numbers you see down here are the Z value for how high up the threshold uh, is. So if you, if you use a low threshold versus a high threshold, in other words. Um, and here you can see, uh, you can see how it changes and how you actually get a decrease in the reliability, uh, in the reproducibility, once you get to very high, um, once you get to very high thresholds. So actually thresholds that are too high seem to be undesirable, uh, presumably because you're just getting a lot of false negatives. 
So here, you know, we, we would want to, we want the kappa index to be as high as possible, all right? So you'd imagine that you'd want to be somewhere in here, right? Between 2.6 and three, somewhere around there. By the way, I should say, the way they produced these numbers is that they, they again, they, they, they created five different groups of 16 uh, subjects and then did all these different thresholds. And that's how they calculated um, the reliability. Um, if you look at sensitivity, uh, the, the idea is exactly the same. Sensitivity is, is, a, is a decreasing function of threshold because the higher the threshold, the more stringent your analysis is, your correction is. And so of course, the more false negatives you're going to have. And you can see this actually is really a fairly sort of, fairly straight down, which makes, makes good sense. Uh, if you look at the distance between the centroids, you sort of get this this U-shaped uh, um, this U-shaped uh, function, and the same is true if you get slightly larger um, slightly larger um, uh, clusters. Uh, and of course, so this means that you know we we want the distance between the clusters to be minimized, right? We want the distance between the clusters. If we get these 16 participants or those 16 participants, right? We want the distance between the clusters to be the smallest possible. And here it looks like, regardless of whether you have small clusters or larger clusters, um, you know, somewhere between you know 28 and, and 32 seems to be the magic number, right? Both here and down here. So again, their um, their conclusion. Uh, was that they find that a, a relatively low value for the optimal threshold uh, is 2.7, somewhere between a Z of 2.7 to 3, which corresponds to a P value of 0.003 to 0.001. And I should point out, they use the word low value, uh, but it's very relative. If you think of it, a lot of papers were actually published with a threshold of 2.3. So 2.7 and uh, between 2.7 and 3 is actually not what the field considers a low value. 